we've got sound. Now this little microphone can be a little bit temperamental, but I'm getting a lapel one coming. So I was talking there five minutes ago and it just fell off. <laughs> so bear with us. <laughs> but you can hear me a little bit better now. So that, that struck me as something quite incredible that our body can heal itself. Now, you might say, well, isn't that fairly obvious? Well, unfortunately, it's not fairly obvious. If we, if we cut ourselves, we know that it will heal, but there are certain conditions to ensure that it will heal. Isn't that right? We've got to clean it. We've got to um, pull those two bits together and it could be stitched or it could be taped or uh, there's a mix called pine pitch, which is the pitch out of the pine tree. You can actually buy pine pitch. And my daughter lives in Wisconsin and her 12-year-old her boy was playing around with his, uh, you call it a pocket knife or a pen knife, and gouged the inside of his finger. It's this huge gaping hole. Well, she just poured pine pitch in it. And what pine pitch does, and you probably know of the pitch from the pine tree, as it dries it goes hard like a scab, but that pine also has some healing properties in it. So it acts like a disinfectant. And she showed me photos just incredible. Within one week, there was just a tiny scar there. And because it is so gooey and because it dries out and goes hard, when you buy pine pitch, it's in like an oil which helps to keep it soft. But just another illustration of this incredible body that we live in. The pine pitch didn't heal that, the body healed it. But it healed it because it was given the right conditions. It was clean, it was able to pull together because as the pine pitch dries it, it shrinks up. And there are some antiseptic properties in it because our skin is like a covering and whenever you break that covering, you now expose the inside to microbes, etc., that are in the air. And that brings me to what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the, the true cause of healing or the, or the true way that our body heals. And in looking at that, we need to look at the theories that abound today as to why people are sick. And there are two main theories in medicine today. One's the gene theory and one's the germ theory. I call it the two genes. It's not me, it's my genes. But I've got some good news is that even though genetics may load the gun, it is lifestyle that pulls the trigger. And I saw this in my father. I'm the eldest daughter and of five children. There's my brother, then me, then the other girls. And as the eldest daughter, I was the helper. You know, when everyone says they're the eldest girl in the family, I say, you're the hard worker. <laughs> Not to say that the others aren't, but usually it's the eldest girl. And so I was always having to get my father his puffer. He called it his puffer. And we're looking at the late 50s here. It was like a rubber bowl with glass tubing and a little cork here or there. And then you put the medicine in and he puffed it. So I'm one of five children. None of us had asthma except my younger sister. And she was severely sick with asthma. So can you see the genes? My father had it. The first four children didn't, but the youngest child did it. And you can probably all, when you look at your, your siblings, your children, your nieces, your nephews, you see the different um, genes that come through. I was just talking to Christina and I said, what's your ancestry? Because she looks like a, a Swede. <laughs> she said, I'm a little bit of everything. <laughs> and maybe at this time of Earth's history, we're all a little bit of everything, but there's a bit of European there. Just another illustration how the different genes that come through. I, as the elder sister, used to look after my baby sister. I used to sit on her bed and sing her songs and read her stories when she was having terrible asthma attacks. I remember the the ambulance coming to my home twice, taking my baby sister away. Wow! And you think, those rotten genes. <laughs> it's because of the genes. My sister finally conquered this at the age of 40. 
<laughs> so imagine my alarm when my fifth child, I gave birth to six babies, my fifth child is lying on my lap with those telltale signs of severe physiological asthma. I knew quite a few natural treatments by the time I had five children because I lived in a rainforest and I, I didn't, you know, it's an hour to the hospital. And when you go to the hospital, then you're sitting in there and you're thinking, why am I here? But I'm here because I'm scared of my, of my little one. You see, there are two main, main theories of, of uh, healing. One's based, based on fear and the other one's based on faith. But you know, faith has to have some substance, is that right? <laughs> it has to have some substance and, and a relationship and experience there because you've seen what it does, so you have faith. And faith is based on the fact that the Creator God created our body. It's based on the fact that we were created, but we, would, we weren't just created, we were created to heal. And if we are not well, then there are herbs that God created that work with the human body, like the pine pitch and the, <laughs> and the gouged out finger that actually can come to, to heal. But there's another system and it's based on fear. And it's based on a theory that we evolved and because we evolved, uh, we cannot heal. And so because we cannot heal, a drug has to come along to, to actually bring about some sort of healing. But the fact is no drug can heal. No drug can heal. In fact, they never heal. I acknowledge that in a crisis, a drug can save a life, absolutely, but they cannot heal. Only the body can heal. Herbs cannot heal. What they do is they work with the body to bring about a healing response. The body and the body alone has the only, only, only system that can heal. This is the truth. And this system is based on truth. But this system, what's the opposite of truth? <laughs> well, there's something more effective than lies. It's called deception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this one, do you know what it leads to? It leads to life. Yeah. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, easy to remember, 10.10, 10, he says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's what I'm interested in. This one, unfortunately, well, what's the opposite of life? Death. Oh, do. There's a book called Dead Doctors Don't Lie. <laughs> I'm not against doctors. Some of my best friends are doctors. I'm against the system. Yes. The system that's based on evolution that says we need drugs to heal. Do you know my, my husband went to a protest last Sunday, was on the beach. We're about an hour and a half from the beach. But an hour and a half is not, not a long way when you're in Australia. And all along the beach, it had photographs of young people, teens in their 30s, 20s, some in their 40s, and it had their story perfectly well till they had what some call the clot shot. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's a deception. And how many people were deceived into having something they didn't really want to have because they were going to lose their job, they couldn't visit their sick mother. Yeah, it's a, it's a deceptive theory. My son, his mate, his friend, he's 32, his girlfriend, she didn't want to lose her job, so she had it. I have to be careful on the words I use because if this is put up on YouTube, it gets taken down. So she had it. She got so sick she couldn't go to work and she lost her job. Yeah. She's 30 and her, husband, her boyfriend has to help her go to the bathroom. I, and I only, am the master of my destiny. God's government is a government of freedom. So we can put freedom in here, yeah? And freedom is based on free choice. And God gave us a brain that wants to know why. 
And if someone says, you've got to have this, you know what you say? Thank you so much for your advice. I'm going to seriously consider this. Because that's your right. Mm -hmm. That's your right to seriously consider this. What's the opposite to freedom? Eh. Slavery. Eh. Where you have no rights and no choice. I just went to Mount Rushmore. Yeah. And you look at what these men stood for. What did they stand for? Freedom. <laughs> Free choice. It's my right. I'm the master of my destiny. I am the one that chooses what goes into my body and what doesn't. It's your right. So if the human body was designed to heal itself, why everyone so sick? Well, not everyone, but many. The human body is designed to heal itself. There's a little two-letter word here, if you give it the right conditions. So there's the one-letter word. Here's the two-letter word and the three-letter word, one of my favorites. I hope you can see it way down here. It's why. The reason why so many people are sick is because of ignorance and deception plays on ignorance, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Knowledge is power. And there's a little four-letter word too. Sometimes it takes time. My daughter Emma, when she was four, she said, Mum, I'm going to grow up in a minute. Well, we know she didn't grow up in a minute, don't we? I don't know about you, but I want to be better in a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was only six and a half weeks ago that I ran into my friend's bedroom because it was storming to close her windows and smash my little toe smashed against her nice wooden bedpost. It hurt a lot, but then it eases. And I looked at it 20 minutes later and I thought, oh, that's a strange position for my little toe. <laughs> Maybe I did smash it badly. So I bound it up together, put some comfrey. You've heard of comfrey? Comfrey is a herb that has a growth stimulant in it. It's got a nickname. It's called knit bone. And I bound it up. And I'll tell you what, I wanted that to be better in a minute, but it's not better in a minute. I'm just thank God that I was only on crutches for 24 hours. And then I limped. <laughs> and then I found this fairly ugly looking boot that did enable me to walk with no pain. <laughs> but you know, it heals, doesn't it? And it heals if you give it the right conditions. One lady said, didn't you go to ER? Didn't you have an x-ray? I said, why? It's not rocket science. If the, t if the toe's in a funny direction, something has happened. Well, let's pull it back and bind it up and keep it in that same position. Do you know that's what people did 100 years ago? That's right. Isn't that right? And you know, common sense isn't very common today. <laughs> no. And you know there's been a death and no one attended the funeral because no one even knew he died. It was the death of common sense. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that what I've just shown you there, it appeals to your common sense. So when my youngest son, fifth son, was dying on my lap, and doesn't a mother know that? When the nostrils flare at every breath. <laughs> when the muscles are cramping from the hip to the, to the neck, you know you've got to do something. Isn't that right? I had fear, absolutely. Granted fear. So I went to the hospital. I looked on their faces and I knew that my son was in a very serious condition. He was only 10 months old. They gave him something called Ventolin. That, re that, that opens the bronchials. But I noticed that my son was the best if I just held him, kept him close, kept him calm, kept him calm. He was breastfed. But oh, it was a tough time. He'd be in severe breathing stress for 24 hours. And I noticed the drug didn't seem to do a lot. And then I think we took him to the hospital three times. Yes, out of fear, just, you don't want, you don't want to lose your son. But you know what I noticed? They, whatever they did, didn't do a lot. Sometimes you're in hospital and you immediately relax because you think you're in a safe environment. Wow, but I, some people have told me what's happened in that hospital. Their rights have been taken away from them. Their child has been... Isn't that sad? The very place you go to for help sometimes. 
And that's why, to my dying breath, I will do what I am doing to educate people to know what to do. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. I've felt there, I've been there, and it's terrifying. And then I read in a newspaper that Ventolin reduces lung capacity. <laughs> Every drug has a side effect. That's why they do not heal. They might mask a symptom, and absolutely in a crisis they may save a life, but they do not heal. So I went to a naturopath. I already knew some simple natural treatments, but it didn't seem to do much with Peter. I had to do a few things. I had to do some hot and cold treatments to him. I had to give him an enema. It takes a bit of work. <laughs> when I started to implement the herbs, the, the hot and cold treatments, breathing distress went from 24 hours down to five hours. Wow, I'm interested. <laughs> I'm in. That five hours was still a bit tough. I did a lot of praying. I did a lot of praying one night when the storm was raging and I could not take him to where I thought I'd get help. Oh, and in the morning he was alive. Oh, I thank God for that, but us, oh, terrifying. The naturopath said to me, everything you're doing to Peter, he'll be as strong as an ox. Well, you should see him today. <sighs> He's as strong as an ox. What I did took time. There's a little book called The Ministry of Healing. It was one of my first books. I just love it. She says, Nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual and to the impatient it seems slow. Can you see why I had to memorise that one? I had to say it several times a day when my little toe was broken. <laughs> but you know, when my little toe had been broken four weeks, I was able to wear my barefoot runners and I climbed up the Rocky Mountains National Park to the Emerald Lake. <laughs> And how do I know I could do it? Because my body, my toe said, yeah, this, I can handle this. Many people don't listen, and you've got to listen. Yeah. Ever been to a doctor who won't listen? How frustrating is that? Don't be that doctor. Hmm? The body speaks, and I, I went round at a fast pace round Bear Lake, and the toe said, great, and I said to the you, two young men next to me, I looked at my clock, we didn't have long, I said, I reckon we can do it. They said, great, and up we went. And we got up to Emerald Lake, 12,000 feet. We were so hot, I looked at them and said, let's just dive in, and we did. <laughs> you gotta listen, and, so, and, and when the toe had been broken in three weeks, my toe would have said, don't you even think about it. But you've got to give it time. And that's where we get impatient, isn't it? And because a drug can take a symptom away, sometimes in half an hour, we get spoiled, don't we? But there was something that I did that could take all my pain away in 15 minutes, and that was alternating hot and cold, if my foot was sore. So there are some simple treatments that can, you can get an effect fairly quickly. Three minutes hot, 30 seconds ice cold, three times. How long does that take? Less than 15 minutes. How long does Tylenol take to get an effect? Half an hour, 40 minutes? Yeah. So there are some simple treatments that will bring relief quite quickly. My son Peter had his last asthma attack at the age of two and a half. Hmm? My father, he struggled till 50 and he finally stopped dairy products. <laughs> that made a big difference to him. My sister Yvonne finally conquered it at 40. My son Peter, two and a half. Genetics may load the gun. Peter was born with a loaded gun to asthma. The doctor said he was born with severe physiological asthma. And you know what the medicine says? There is no cure. No cure. Have you heard that? No cure. They say there's no cure for diabetes. We've seen several people get off all their medication with type 1 diabetes. Did you hear that? This is a little bit of a taste of what we're going to look at this week. What an amazing body we live in.
And when it's given the right conditions, it will respond. And, if you, and just remember my daughter, Emma. She didn't grow up in a minute. We don't heal in a minute. It can take time. Right now, at uh, probably six and a half weeks, it's as if I never even broke my little toe. But at the moment, <laughs> when I was on crutches, when I was had that horrible looking boot that brought great relief, I'd say to the ladies when I'd lecture, don't get jealous of my boot. <laughs> I tried to put it behind and have my nice shoe in front. <laughs> takes time. takes time, but the body will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. And this week I'm going to show you those conditions, I'm going to teach you those conditions. So that you don't need to have fear. And faith grows strong by earnest conflict with fear and doubt. Isn't that good news? So let's go inside the body. We're going to go here a few times this week. It's called the CBD of the human body. It's the inside workings of the cell. And when you know how the cell works, then you know what to give it to maintain it, and you also start to know what to do to it to bring about healing. Because that's what we are. We're a bunch of cells, aren't we? Eye cells, skin cells, pancreatic cells, bone cells. And when you understand how the cell works, then you start to know how it heals. So I'm going to give you a few facts now. 75 trillion cells run like this. We have 100 trillion cells in the body. Where are the other 25 trillion? That's our red blood cells. And our red blood cells carry nutrients to the CBD, carry water to the, new, to the CBD, carry oxygen to the CBD, central business district of the human body, take away waste. That's what the blood does. The Bible says in Leviticus 17.11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood is life because of what it carries. That's why when a young man said to me, the, the doctor says my pancreas is dead. I said, what is it, gangrene? What's dead? You can't have half dead or a little bit dead. It's either dead or it's not dead. So within three weeks, he's gone from 90 units of insulin a day to 10 units of insulin a day. Is his pancreas dead? No, because if there's blood going through the pancreas, there's life. Right in the middle of the cell, there's a nucleus. And right inside the nucleus is the DNA. The DNA is the genetic code that determines the color of our skin, color of our eyes, color of our hair. And we have 23 chromosomes from our mother. We have 23 chromosomes from our father. And we started off by talking about Christina's blondness and tallness and my investigation as to, as to where these genes may have come from. I always thought I was five foot two and a half. It was quite devastating for me a few weeks ago when I was measured and I'm five foot one and a quarter. Maybe they were wrong, I don't know. But I've, my, my three sons will never be six foot because look, look at the height of their mother. But you know what they've lacked in height, they've made up for in muscle. Now, I've got a very slight body type, and my three boys, they inherited, well, two of them inherited. Peter actually inherited this, but the other two boys didn't. Well, the other two boys are like that now because they worked at it. <laughs> Supplemented with protein, worked out, and now, yes, they're, they're big and muscly. But my point is that they... Most boys, not all in every case, but many boys inherit their, their mother's tendencies. You possibly have seen that. And so my boys inherited my small body type, but that, they were able to change that. You see, genetics may load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. Isn't that good news? So my son James, whoa, is he big now. <laughs> but he worked out, he worked out big time. Genetics may load the gun, but it is lifestyle pulls the trigger. It's called epigenetics, which is the study of our lifestyle on our genes. You can actually switch your genes on or you can switch them off. So with Peter, we switched his asthma gene off. Asthma, um, so what's Peter now? He's probably about four, 36, something like that. 
in and around that. He has three children. None of them have chest problems. None of them have asthma. So you can actually change your genes. That's good news. There's a lot of information in here. In fact, if you were to put all the information that's in this DNA it would, and put it in alphabetical language it would, and put it in paperback books, it would go to the moon and back a few times. I can hardly get my ma mind around that piece of information. Huge amount of information is in the DNA. And in 1953, headlines in the newspaper said secret of life had been discovered. Two scientists, Watson and Cricks, had been able to unravel the DNA. You can pull it out two metres long and it'll curl back in. Huge amount of information in there. Why did they say secret of life had been discovered? Because they thought if we play with these genes a little bit, um, sick people can become well. Well, are we any better? No. Are our hospitals getting smaller? No. no, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Did you know that child um, fatality in the world, do you know which country is the highest? The US. Yeah. I read a book called The Midwife from Auschwitz. When I'm traveling a lot, I like to get lost in a true story. This lady in Auschwitz, imagine the conditions, uh, severe malnutrition, horrific sanitary conditions. She delivered 3,000 babies in two years and did not lose a baby. Did you hear that? Did not lose a baby. We've got so much problems today because of intervention. Intervention too soon. Absolutely, I believe medicine holds a place in a crisis. But you know, birth is not a crisis. Yeah? <laughs> we have been having babies for, for centuries. This DNA is made up of the food that we eat. The outside strands is made up of polysaccharides. And polysaccharides simply means many sugars. Everything we eat has many sugars. The inside bands is made up of amino acids, and amino acids is a breakdown from the protein that we eat. As a, as a plant-based person, my protein comes from beans, nuts and seeds, and these are all glued together by minerals. And the food that's the highest in minerals is our vegetables, and the vegetables that are the highest in minerals is dark, green, leafy. Hippocrates, 400 years BC, he's called the father of medicine. He said, let food be your medicine, and medicine be your food. And he didn't know what I've just shown you. Our very DNA is made up of the food that we are eating, and we are constantly being remade. It seems like a tiny little step to say that nothing I do can change the fact that I'm around five foot two and that I have white skin and I don't have much grey hair. That's because both my parents hardly went grey. My husband's white and both his parents were white at 50. See, it's in the genes. So it seems like a tiny little step to say nothing I can do will change the fact that my, ma that my father had rheumatoid arthritis and so, so will I. Can you see the tiny little step? But as I showed you in the story of my father, my sister and my son, that genetics may load the, the gun, but it is lifestyle that pulls the trigger. So you need not pull that trigger, but most people don't realise that. How many people think it happened to my father, so it's going to happen to me? It happened to my mother, so it's going to happen to me? And did you know, and we'll talk about this way, way at the end of the week, on Saturday morning, I'm going to the mind. <laughs> and if you think you're going to get sick, guess what? You do, because all your, all your body, all the cells in your body are very obedient to the mind. That's why the lady said to me last week, I can't sleep, I can't sleep, I never sleep. I said, well, my first suggestion is to never say that again. I'm going to try. Because you know what the body says? Oh, we can't sleep. And it doesn't sleep. We're constantly being remade according to the pattern, according to the formula. And everyone knows if they have grey hair and they want brown hair and they go and have it dyed, what happens within a month? <laughs> Our hair grows half an inch in the month, it comes out white again. 
and I can wear high heel shoes and maybe I can come up to even five foot five, but it, I can't change what I am. We are constantly being remade according to the formula. So the eye cells, they're remade every one to two days. That's why if you get something in your eye, you've got to get it out. Because if you leave it there for a couple of days, guess what can happen? The cells can, can grow over it. And when something's in our eye, it is so uncomfortable, we cannot rest till we get it out. That's listening to the body. We had a guy that got a bit of metal in his eye, and this is when we're two hours from town, way up in the rainforest, and one smart thinker said, get a magnet. I tell you this, because how, how smart is that? And put the magnet to the eye, and that bit of metal flew out of the eye to the mag magnet. You've got to... You've got to um, What's the old saying? Necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> when you live in a rainforest, you become great inventors. <laughs> what can we do? What can we do? And this is one extra one, which I think is often a, a, a big secret, is the great God of heaven delights to help us, but we've just got to ask. We're constantly being remade. We've got new skin every month. We've got uh, new liver under the right rib. We're going to talk about the liver in more detail tomorrow. Under the, under the right rib, it's remade every six weeks. Bones are about every three months. The cells that line our gastrointestinal tract, they're remade every three to five days. So if this is true, why don't people heal? Well, it is estimated that every, in about two years we've got a totally new body. So why aren't we healing? The reason we're not healing is there's damage to the DNA, there's damage to the formula. And if the formula's not right, the new cell cannot be re remade aright. I, I heard the story of a lady who made a beautiful cake and everyone wanted the recipe but she'd leave out one ingredient so no one could make her beautiful cake. I think it's a bit silly myself. <laughs> And people say to me, I can't cook. I said, no, I couldn't cook either till I discovered recipes. <laughs> you just go to the recipe and you get the dish. Well, I don't use them anymore because now I, now I know. But the recipe or the formula is very important and exactly the same with the remaking of our body. So, so why, why aren't bodies being made right? One is damage to the DNA. What causes the damage? 92% of damage to the DNA, the research is showing today, is caused by a mineral deficiency. So how could we be mineral deficient? Let's have a look at the food. In his book, The Calcium Lie, Dr. Robert Thompson, he says, he, well, he shows the figures. He says, 50 years ago, there was twice as many nutrients in the soil as there is today. Why? You know, this should be on our lips at every step. Why? Why? Newton's third law of motion states that to every action, there's an equal and an opposite reaction. There is always a reason. To say there is no cause is to defy basic common sense and science. Well, it's the way that people are doing agriculture today. They do the same crop in the same soil again and again and again. And if you've studied gardening, organic gardening, you will know if you put a tomato in, the next crop should be a carrot. <laughs> and then after the carrot, and then you might do, you call it cilantro. So you, you change between your top and your root crops because different vegetables take different nutrients out of the soil. And before you put another crop in, you've got to feed the soil because every crop takes nutrients out of the soil. If the soil's deficient because of farming again and again and again, and the Bible has some very good advice. It says every seven years, let the ground lay fallow it's caused. Don't grow anything. <laughs> let it have a rest. You know, it's interesting, every seven years, and in the Bible it says every seventh day we should have a rest. And rest is an important law of health. And when it gets a rest, it revives. Don't you feel good when you've had a rest? A lot of people come to our retreat for a rest. They go home recharged, and the ground needs a rest. So if the ground's deficient, the plant's deficient, and the person that eats that plant will be? Deficient. deficient. Yeah, that, it's just basic 
common sense, isn't it? It's not rocket science. But something else is happening. Well, by the way, when people are uh, living on fast foods, obviously they're going to be mineral deficient because there's hardly any minerals in, this, in those foods. But we're even finding mineral deficiency in people that are eating fruits and vegetables every day. And it's because the soil's deficient. But something else is happening, and that is stimulants. And these stimulants are leaching the minerals out of the body. So what's one stimulant? Refined sugar. There's nothing wrong with the sugar cane. And have you ever eaten sugar cane? It takes about half an hour to eat two inches. You know, it takes one metre to deliver one teaspoon of sugar. can of Coca-Cola, ten teaspoons of sugar. If you, if you want to drink a can of Coca-Cola, you, you should be prepared to eat ten metres of sugar cane. And there's no way you could eat that in a day. Your jaw and your teeth would break. So in other words, it's a highly concentrated substance, is refined sugar. I'm not talking about maple syrup. I'm not talking about honey. I'm not talking about even palm sugar, which is just the crystallized nectar of the palm flower. I'm talking about the highly concentrated refined sugar. There was no diabetes on the planet till that was established. Gets the blood sugar level up high, fast, and then you get a corresponding dump. <laughs> so pancreases wear out with this constant whiplash, up, down, up, down, up, down. And what's happening today is we're getting children born. Well, uh, there, there was a case in the paper of a baby born with diabetes. That baby hasn't been on the planet long enough. <laughs> so when are you going to go back and look at the parents and, oh dear, and this is what you'll often find, the mother had a sugar addiction. As one little girl said to me, she's nine, she's got diabetes at nine. She said, my mother eats a bag of candy a day. Wow. And it's just not the one that, what, odd day someone might do it or the odd day they don't. It's what they do every day that determines this. So the refined sugar not only damages the DNA, which means that child can be born with a weakened pancreatic gene, but it's like what happened with the asthma story I just told you about. <laughs> only one in the five children had it, and then only one in my six children had it. You can have a mother that's eating a bag of candy a day, but not all her children will be born with a weakened pancreatic gene. But not only that, refined sugar leaches the body of minerals. One writer said, sugar leaves the body better dressed than when it went in. What did it go in with? Totally naked. What did it come out with? Dress with our minerals. Because calcium is the most alkaline mineral and the pure crystallized acid that's extracted from the sugar cane is such an acid substance that the body has to calm it down with our minerals. And so what's happening to the bones and the teeth? <laughs> They're getting weaker and weaker. Caffeine. We call it Australia's darling. I think it's the America's darling too. And what caffeine does, it's also a poison. There's a book by um, Kachansky, I think his name is. It's called Caffeine Blues. <laughs> because caffeine might give a lift, but then it'll give a corresponding dump. Yeah. So if this is where your mood is, it'll bring you up, and isn't that why most people take it, but then guess what happens? It dumps you lower than where you began. To take coffee for an uh, energy boost is like taking out a loan to pay off your loan. What eventually happens? <laughs> eventually there's nothing left. What's the old saying? Robbing, robbing Peter to pay Paul doesn't make any sense at all. People say to me, do you, do you drink coffee, Barbara? I say, no, I just watch the people suffer. Day one, Misty Mountain Health Retreat. <laughs> More people suffer from caffeine withdrawals than any withdrawals. And if you're a coffee drinker, please don't stop or you'll suffer. But what you can do is you can start reducing it. If you start reducing it a little bit less, a little bit less every day, you can usually get off it within, within a week without all the pain and suffering. So what caffeine does, it causes a crisis response. So it basically gets your body ready for a crisis. And that's why people like it. They think, oh, 
this feels good. Well, how would you feel if a, if a tiger just, or a bear, bear's probably more appropriate, a bear came in that room? Whoa! <laughs> hey, and isn't that what happens when someone has a cup of coffee? Ah, oh, that feels good. <laughs> One lady said, oh, I love my coffee. Just gets me going. Well, last week when I was in Black Hills, which is South Dakota, I ran up and down the hills every morning and dipped in their cold mountain stream every morning. Woof! That wakes you up. I tell you, better than coffee. Doesn't give the corresponding dump. Haven't got a creek? Well, it's called turn hot chap, hot tap off and just straight cold. Woof! <laughs> and you don't get the corresponding dump. And the caffeine also leaches minerals out because it is an acid. And so the, these two things are contributing to the teeth decay. They're contributing to the bone loss. What's that called? Osteoporosis. But it, because it disrupts the neurotransmitters in the brain, it has an effect. This is week after week after month after month after year after year of taking it. It damages the DNA to the neurotransmitters. So you can have a couple both having coffee and maybe the girl has a bit of chocolate, the guy has a Dr. Pepper at work, you know, the caffeine things, and they can give birth to a baby that has a weakened DNA to the neurotransmitters so they can be prone to autism, to attention deficit syndrome. And isn't that common now? You've heard of the Australian cook, Jamie Oliver? Jamie Oliver went to the British schools to get them all to have natural foods he said in one class out of 30 kids, there are only two kids not on medication for attention deficit syndrome. Yeah. I can remember what, when I was at school, there were 30 kids a class, there were three classes every grade. I can remember one kid, one kid in the whole school <laughs> had attention deficit syndrome because he couldn't sit still. And when Jamie Oliver came into those schools and got fruits, a lot of fruits and natural foods into the tuck shop and got out all the refined sugars, the caffeines, the, the uh, refined foods. The, the teachers are saying, it's just amazing, the kids are just sitting still in class and listening. And the parents are saying, the kids are coming home and just sitting and talking to us. You know, the, the, all because of the food they were eating. Stimulants. And it's crept up onto Australians and Americans, and it doesn't tell you on the packet that there are any dangers, does it? Here's the deception. The deception's coming in. What also causes a leaching of minerals out of the body is alcohol. Alcohol's a toxic poison. Alcohol kills brain cells. Now, that's a bit scary. But alcohol, as a poison, the body again uses its minerals to calm it down. So it's leaching the minerals. And tobacco, I used to say there were 4,000 chemicals in a cigarette. My sister, who studied this in detail, she said, you know, there are 7,000 now. Chemicals in the cigarette. And this brings us to the next one, which is chemicals. So be careful, be careful of your home. It's time to uh, look at the label on your clothes. <laughs> there are three chemical fabrics. One is acrylic, the other is nylon, and the other is polyester. I was so excited last night when I got into my bed, linen sheets, feather quilt, oh. I stayed in one place, and when I got into the sheets, I could feel the electricity, not an electricity I want. Did you know that that static, it absorbs more chemicals out of the air? So I said to the lady the next night, um, do you mind if I put cotton sheets on the bed? I'm just so careful not to offend people. While you sleep, you want an environment conducive to sleep. We've got so many things today that are interfering with sleep. So natural fabric. Many people don't think of fabric. The other thing to think of is what, what are you washing your clothes in? My daughter recently, her front loader broke down and the, and the mechanic came and fixed it. And he said, you know, these front loader machines especially are so effective, you can wash your clothes with no detergent. 
Do you hear that? Isn't that incredible? I, I stayed in a place in Europe last year and I went to wash my clothes and I'm reading the, <laughs> the labels and I thought, oh, I'm just going to wash it with water. Washed it in water. And in Australia, we do something they don't do much here. We've got clothes lines. Do you remember them? <laughs> That sun purifies your clothes. And I put my clothes on the line and I smelt them in detail, especially in the areas where we perspire and it smelt sweet. And that's the, that's the only time. But you're, you can get biodegradable washing detergent and I certainly understand if you've got a man who's working in the sun all day and he's, <laughs> and he's perspiring a lot in dirt, you may need a little bit of, bit of soap. And they're more expensive, the biodegradable washing detergents, but I know you have Trader Joe's, Sprouts, things like that where you can get them. They're more expensive, but the good news, whatever they tell you to use, quarter it. Quarter it. That's good news because as we go through this, you, can use, you might be starting thinking this is going to cost. It's going to cost to throw it. One lady said to me, Barbara, I just read all the labels on my clothes in my suitcase. There's nothing. And how many ladies use the polyester because you don't have to iron it? Well, the clothes I have on this morning, nothing's been ironed. I'm just carefully, this is cotton, this is silk, this is viscose. Viscose is bamboo. That's nice to know. And rayon and modal are both made from wood pulp. And it is true that there is a chemical that softens the wood. So when you buy them, please wash them and hang them on the clothesline. Remember that thing? The clothesline. And, and, you can, and you can wear it. Also, if you buy cotton, you really must wash it and put it on the clothesline. Because cotton is one of the most sprayed crops. I'm talking about this because our skin is an organ not of of elimination, but it's an organ of absorption. So be careful what touches your skin. Chemicals on clothes, chemical on cleaning products. One of the worst things you can put in your clothes is fabric softener. You want a nice smell? Put some lavender essential oil in. (laughs) You're going to save a fortune with, with, with getting rid of all of those things in your laundry cupboard. All that's in my laundry cupboard is sodium bicarbonate and white vinegar. And if something's particularly stubborn, put the white vinegar and the sodium bicarbonate together. You'll get a nice fizzing reaction. Then get what they call elbow grease, scrubbing brushes. <laughs> but they don't smell very nice. Well, then you wipe everything down with lavender essential oil or eucalyptus. But the biggest chemical company in the world is the pharmaceutical company. Drugs are chemicals. If you are on medication, I'm not suggesting you stop straight away. You start giving your body the right conditions, start to strengthen it, and as we go through these classes this week, I'll be mentioning some drugs that you can stop immediately with no adverse effect, but there are some that you'll need to ease off. Well, what can you stop straight away? So I could mention that now, aspirin. Do you know what aspirin does now? They've discovered it causes stomach bleeds, eye bleeds, and brain bleeds. Did you know that cayenne pepper will thin the blood more effectively than aspirin, and if there is a bleed anywhere, it'll even heal that. No need for rat poison, I mean warfarin. That's what it is. But most people take it because of this, is that right? We don't want to die. And that's understandable, I don't want to die, life's good. Got too many grandchildren to die yet. We're looking at what causes damage to the DNA. Genetically modified foods. Mm -hmm. Monsanto's so powerful it wins every court case where Americans and Australians are trying to put it on the label. Have you noticed? But if an organic farmer uses genetically modified seed, they lose their organic status. And you have the advantage of shops like Trader Joe's Sprouts. We don't have them in Australia. You can get organic, but you go to specific stores. But I've noticed that even in Costco, there's an organic section. So go organic as much as possible. 
It's important to read your labels. You might have to go to the supermarket with a magnifying glass. Have you noticed it's in the small print? <laughs> the bit they're hoping you haven't got your glasses on today so you can't even read it. I saw a lady in a supermarket one day and she had a, she had a wire around her neck and she had a magnifying glass this big. <laughs> Someone might say, well, that's going to take forever to shop. Only the first time. When I go into the supermarket now, there are some aisles I don't even go down. I know exactly where I want to go. One lady said, go around the edges. There's all the fresh stuff. <laughs> around the edges. Vladimir Putin, uh, he's uh, Russia's president. He's passed a law about 15 years ago. Any Russian who grows or sells genetically modified foods is to be considered a terrorist. Now, that's not on mainstream media. Whatever I read on mainstream media about Vladimir Putin, I have to tell you, you, you believe the opposite. Is that right? Yes. So much deception out there. So um, Australia banned me, because as you'll see as we go through this, I am a threat to public safety. <laughs> Apparently. <Yeah. laughs> but do you know what it's done? People have started to hear about what Onion does, and so someone, I don't even know who, puts me up on Instagram and social media. And the HCCC, the Healthcare Complaints Commission, tried to silence me. Have they silenced me? <laughs> Isn't that incredible? I'm so glad that there are many people that do believe, know, that I am the master of my destiny. Yes. And free choice, isn't that what you know, and free speech. You have free speech in your constitution, don't you? We've discovered that we don't. But it's our God-given right that we still make those choices. What is genetically modified food? It's when the DNA of two different species is spliced together, hoping to create a tomato that grows in the snow. But if you notice, it doesn't. But that tomato that's been genetically modified, it now has five centres. Don't you get concerned when you eat a watermelon with no seeds? What's happened there? Now we need those seeds to be able to reproduce. Isn't that true? Mould. In nature, mould splices into other species to reproduce itself. There's one snail and they know that the mould has spliced into it because its antenna grow three times longer and have uh, psychedelic ends on them. But we see it a lot in things like lichen and mould in nature. Can that happen in the human body? Now we're going to be having a look at microbes. What are microorganisms? As the name implies, they're microscopic. You cannot see them. In fact, they're everywhere. They're on my skin, they're on every chair, and they're nothing to fear. They're everywhere. In fact, there are 10 times more microorganisms in our body than cells. Does that mean we're more plant than animal? Well, actually, these, a lot of these microorganisms you can't put into plant or anim animal. And there are 10 times more microorganisms in the gastrointestinal tract than anywhere else in the body. And whenever cell damage happens, so what I want to look at, I want to look at, well, what is their role on the planet? What is their role in the body? Whenever cell damage happens, these microorganisms change roles. They now become the cleanup team. And that's what one microbiologist said to me that did our health program. He said, oh, Barbara, we call them the cleanup team or the garbage collectors, or you call them trash collectors. So the truck came to pick up, you call it trash, don't you? What do you call that truck? A gar we call it a gar oh, you call it a garbage truck. Okay, garbage collectors. What's their name? These microorganisms that now have changed roles because of the cell damage, their name is bacteria. And I'm sure a lot of that garbage that was collected didn't smell very good, is that right? It's bacteria, that's its name, and that's what it does on the planet. 
It's part of the clean-up team. As the environment changes, so do these microbes. They have the ability to change roles. We have the ability to change roles. I'm not dressed now the way I was dressed when I was at my daughter's place in the middle of winter last year. I got boots and <laughs> big coat. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed if I'm in Fiji, which I will be in... Uh, in December, I'll have a very light dress on because it's so hot. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I'm walking in the morning. I'm not dressed now the way I'm dressed when I'm digging in the garden. I'm not dressed now the way I dressed when I slept last night. We change roles. So do the microbes. They change roles. We change roles according to the environment. They change roles according to the environment. As the environment changes, they now become the exterminators. So what's the exterminator's name? And the whole world stopped in 2020 over one of these. Yeast and fungus and virus. If you have a look at the properties or functions of a yeast and fungus, they're actually the same as a virus. The whole world stopped over a virus. You weren't allowed to go near each other. You weren't allowed to touch anything. If you couldn't go into a shop without, what's this, sanitizer stuff, I'd pretend and walk in like this and everyone's happy. It's mad. The microbes aren't the problem, it's the environment. As the environment changes, so do the microbes, they now become the undertakers. And what do undertakers do? They take away dead things. The undertaker's name is mold. What I've drawn for you here is the cycle of life. And the cycle of life is the cycle that brings matter back to dust. That's what the microbes do. That is their main role, the role of bringing matter back to dust. And if it wasn't for these microorganisms, there'd be so much rubbish, garbage, trash on the planet, we wouldn't be able to walk on the planet. That's, their, that's one of their main rules, is bringing matter back to dust. So if they're in high amounts in any area, we should have our detective hat on to find out why are they there? They have a role, they have a purpose. Have you noticed? that the CDC figures stated 99% of people that got COVID recovered. <laughs> hey? What does our reason, intellect and judgment declare? What are we fearing? But the media is powerful. Yes. And it doesn't tell the truth. Yes. And my husband started a political party in Australia three years before COVID. God knew what was ahead, we didn't. It's called the Informed Medical Options Party. We need to be informed. We need to be informed about what's going to happen. And it's our right. It's our right to choose. And so when the police jumped on him, because when they told him he was forbidden to speak and he stood up and spoke, and he actually ran, <laughs> and they couldn't catch him because <laughs> he's fit. <laughs> and it went on the news that night. <laughs> and he's white, so it looks like these police are leaping on this poor elderly gentleman. <laughs> and the police, one of the police was bending his hand back and Marcus said, don't be so res disrespectful, I'm an elderly gentleman. <laughs> and the policeman said, you shouldn't have run. And Marcus said, it's my right. Isn't that true? It's, it's our rights. So we've got to remember what our rights are. But the whole world went crazy. Was it a pandemic at all? No, not at all. And in Australia, this is 2021, news, we watch it sometimes to see what was happening. And the guy comes up with the screen and the statistics. Five more deaths today. Two 90-year-old men and three 85 year since when has a 92-year-old man dying reached the news? My father died six years ago now, 92. That didn't get to the news. See what's happening? You say, I'm seriously going to consider your advice. 
and you do consider it. We should make our decisions on reason, intellect and judgment. Never on fear. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, God says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love and of a sound mind. That's what God's given us. The sound mind that says, hang on a minute. (laughs) This doesn't make any sense. I think the world's doing that now. Well, we hope so. People would say, Barbara, how can, I, how can I protect myself against COVID? This is in 2021. You know what my response was? Stop watching the news. Amen. Because there's nothing to fear here. I got COVID. I think we all did. People say, what did you do? I said, nothing. Absolutely nothing. I laid in bed with a fever. haven't had a fever for 20 years. I slept a lot. I drank a lot of water and I ate hardly anything. That's what I did. Because I live in a body that has an inbuilt ability to heal itself and one of its most powerful tools is the fever. Did you hear that? And guess what puts fires out? Water. (laughs) It's that simple. That simple. You know, there's a lady in Australia that stood up and spoke strongly against it. She's very beautiful. She's, I think, late 30s. She's Samoan, dresses very beautiful, so the media love her. And they cannot take her down because she has no qualifications. Did you hear that? The more qualified they are, you are, the more they can attack you. <laughs> and her husband is a, uh, they're both Samoan. She has a few little children. He's a very famous footballer, but he made a stand. He said, I will not defile my body. And I think you know what they wanted him to defile his body with. So they lost him. Well, France took him up very quickly. Multi-million dollar contract. (laughs) They lost their top player. Okay, it's their choice, and that's what God gave each one of us, isn't that? A choice. But he said, I will not defile my body. Do you know that's what God says in the Bible? He says, don't you know, this is 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, don't you know that ye are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. God doesn't have to destroy it because so many of us destroy it ourselves. But absolutely I acknowledge in ignorance. There are people today who are angry because they were blackmailed into doing it. Isn't that true? And I I think a lot of people now are saying, right, I'm going to find out about these things before. And as one man said, I'll take it if you can show me the safety studies. Well, no safety studies were produced. Did you know that? It takes 30 years. And even the... Even the V's that were, were, were started to be introduced after 30 years, we're still having deaths from them. No, the body can heal itself when you give it the right conditions. And understanding those conditions, it is paramount, it is essential, it is square one to understand the cycle of life. That's what I've just drawn for you. It's the cycle of life or often called the carbon cycle. And a basic law of science states, nothing's created and nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. And if they're active, why are they active? They're just doing their job. There's a contemporary at the time of Louis Pasteur, and by the way, Louis Pasteur made famous the germ theory, germs cause disease. Well, Florence Nightingale, very famous nurse from the mid-1800s, who went to the hospital in Scutari. This is where the wounded from the Crimean War were being taken, and the death rate in that hospital in 1854 was 50%. The young men had a better chance on the battlefront than in that hospital. There was raw sewage in the corridors. The doctors weren't washing their hands between operations. They said, well, I'm already covered in blood. What's the point? Florence went in and she, she, she started to clean up. She cleaned it up big time. And in two months after cleaning it up, the death rate went from 50% to 2%. And when she went back to London, 
They hailed her as a heroine. And when she saw the welcoming party, she saw Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. She changed her name to Mary Smith and went down the back gangplank and went home. <laughs> and they said, why did you do that? She said, I'm not a heroine. All I did was increase hygiene, sanitation and nutrition. Did you hear that? Yeah. Did you know that's why the childhood illnesses are not around anymore? You, you've been deceived if you think it's the... Uh, Vaccines? It is not. They were 80, 90% sometimes wiped out before the vaccine was introduced. That used to be in the medical journals. Did you know that's been taken out, that information? E Increase in hygiene, sanitation. Did you know that in the mid-1800s, all the sewage from London went into the Thames and the people living in London drank the water in the Thames? No wonder the Black Plague happened. Have you seen pictures from that time of children playing in the streets, children that haven't had a bath for six months, and there's sewage and rats in there, and no wonder the Black Plague happened. Hygiene, what's hygiene? This is personal hygiene. Change your clothes every day, wash your body every day. Uh, we're constantly throwing off waste. This is a living organism, and whenever you've got a living organism, and even machinery that's not alive, there's waste, isn't there? <laughs> and we'll look at the organs of elimination tomorrow. So keep the body clean. I don't think you have to desanitize yourself and rub all these chemicals on you. Just keep it clean, just wash your hands with soap and water. That's hygiene. Sanitation, keep the house clean. Sweep the floor. Wash the shower every day. You know, when I come home, my husband doesn't think you have to wash the shower because it's where you get clean. And the, and the grout between the tiles is yellow. <laughs> and I scrub it with my sodium bicarbonate and it becomes white again. <laughs> He sweeps the floor, he's so happy when I come home because the house is tidy and then I go to have my shower. <laughs> Keep the house clean. Mm -hmm. Empty the rubbish and the garbage. Yeah, 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 yeah. And nutrition, you cannot heal unless you're giving the body nutrition. Plant foods will supply all of this in abundance. Your minerals, your many sugars in your fruits and your veggies, your amino acids in your whole grains and your legumes and your nuts and your seeds. And we need to also be mindful of how to prepare them. There's a book called Nourishing Traditions by Sally Fallon. She looks at all the old ways, the old ways. You've got to culture your foods, you've got to sourdough your grains, you've got to soak and pressure cook or, or put in the fuel stove on the corner your, your, uh, your beans and rinse them. That water is dirty water and it produces a lot of wind. <laughs> so get that. So it's just a traditional way of making your vegetables and we'll look at that uh, later in another class. A contemporary at the time of Louis Pasteur, and by the way, Louis Pasteur was a chemist and he was a socialite. He used the media. Aren't you always concerned when someone uses the media? Coca-Cola, look at their media campaign, because you know what? They've got nothing else. <laughs> Whereas a contemporary at the time of Louis Pasteur was Antoine Bouchon, six times professor, and many people have never heard of him, because he didn't go to the media. He was in his laboratory looking through his microscope most of the day. And Antoine Bouchon, he said, germs don't cause disease, they're the result. Doesn't that make the most sense? They're the result of unhealthful conditions. And that's exactly what Florence Nightingale did. She just cleaned up that hospital. She cleaned up that hospital so there was nowhere for the bacteria, yeast, funguses, viruses to work out because they're just opportunist organisms. It's the condition of the body. Did you know Louis Pasteur admitted that on his deathbed? He said Bernard was right. Bernard, uh, he was a contemporary, another doctor scientist, and he believed as Antoine Beauchamp did. 
Germs don't cause disease, they're the result. On his deathbed, Louis Pasteur said, Bernard was right. The microbe is nothing. The organism is everything. Or he called it the terrain. Terrain. So with terrain, we think of terrain as land. And it's like you get an old fruit tree that's 100 years old and all that happens now is old gnarly fruit and the birds are getting it. You weed it, you uh, pile the cow manure up around the bottom. <laughs> you prune it, you water it, and in maybe two years you'll get beautiful fruit. Same with the human body. Weed it, <laughs> water it, <laughs> well feed it, and you'll be amazed at what you will get out of this human body. Yes, the wrinkles will come, but they're coming too soon. <laughs> but probably the, the thing that most people start to complain about from their even 40s, 50s is lack of energy, yeah? Lack of being able to run with the grandchildren, yeah? So Antoine Bouchamp, one day he got a dead cat and he wrapped it in an airtight container. He came back after four months, but first of all, I'm going to tell you what happens to a dead cat in the Australian bush. So a cat dies in the Australian bush. Maybe it falls out of a tree and knocks its head. Maybe a, a dingo grabbed it. I don't know, but it's dead in the, in the Australian bush. Or maybe it happened to eat some bait that the farmers put out for the wild dogs. But there's a cause for death. Well, when it dies in the Australian bush, the, uh, the blowflies lay their maggots, yep, and they start eating up the dead flesh. The, mung, the, dung, beetle, the dung beetles come out, the worms come up, the, uh, the dingo might have a nibble, the kookaburra, might, you've heard of the kookaburra? The crow, they might have a nibble. They're all scavengers. They're, bringing, they're helping to bring matter back to dust. But Antoine Bouchamp had a, put his dead cat in an airtight container. Four months later, he opened it, dust, maybe a few bones. What brought cat back to dust? The microorganisms that are an integral part of living, running cat had to take their suit of clothes off, so to speak, put their rubber gloves and apron on and become the clean-up team. And then as the environment changed, the undertakers, as the environment changed, sorry, exterminators, then undertakers, and it's the next stage is dust. It's the cycle of life. These are the players in the cycle of life. These are the performers in the cycle of life. And that's why if they're there, why are they there? Rudyard Kipling, famous poet, he wrote a whole poem on this. I'll give you the first stanza. He said, I have six trusty serving men. They taught me all I know. Their names are what, why, when, where, how and who. Do you take them with you everywhere you go? And if your uh, health professional gets impatient with your questions, rise, politely excuse yourself, leave and don't pay the bill. <laughs> because that you are employing them. And if the tiler did a bad job in your, in your bathroom, would you pay the bill? We are the consumer and we have power. And money speaks, is that right? <laughs> One friend of mine, she left the specialist's office so frustrated. She walked out, said to the receptionist, don't pay, send me that bill because I'm not going to pay. And she walked out. Have you noticed? Test after test after test. But don't you have a yearly test, Barbara? Never. Well, how do you know something's wrong? My body will tell me. Isn't that right? Yes. My little toe, toe, toe told me it was broken <laughs> and I knew what to do to fix that. There is no need. And the test costs. And sometimes the tests are invasive. Yeah. My husband went to the doctor to have his eye tested and the doctor said, you've got pressure in your eye. I'll refer you to a specialist. And Michael said, no. And he said, Mr O'Neill, you have to see the specialist. And Marcus said, no. Marcus walking out the door and the guy's never heard this before. <laughs> he said, do you want to go blind? And Michael turned around and said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let anyone put a needle in your eye. 
Eh? And it's so sad that many people don't question, I am not going to let anyone put a needle in my eye. Especially the lady that told Michael, she had pressure, went na needle in the eye every month. Six months later, she got cancer in that eye. Three months later, they took her eye. Eh? No, thank you. No, thank you. Mm -mm. Antoine Bouchon got the dust from his dead cat, put it under the microscope. It was alive with microorganisms. Nothing's created, nothing's destroyed. It just changes form. See, those microorganisms that are in your compost bin, isn't that why we have compost bins? I have three, one I'm adding to. Put the scraps from the kitchen, put the weeds from the garden, especially the, the broccoli and corn stalks. It helps to aerate your compost. Maybe if you can get cow manure from healthy cows that aren't fed chemicals, put that in. And then one compost bin is sitting. The microorganisms are all bringing matter back to dust. The third one, I'm digging it out and putting it in my garden. I've got a photograph of me squatting down in the middle smelling that beautiful earth. In fact, I was reading one compost book and they say they always get women to smell the compost because they have a keen sense of smell. Actually, I know when that compost ready because the tomato plants and the squash plants and the pawpaw plants are coming out of it. And I put that into my garden. What am I putting in my garden? Microorganisms. Now they play another role. So here is the plant and here are the root system underneath the soil. When I put that compost into my soil, I'm putting microorganisms in. Now remember, they're microscopic, so you can't see them. Now they play another role. They are responsible for the breakdown of the minerals in the soil and making them available for the plant. Aren't you glad we don't have to eat dirt to get our minerals? In fact, you, you wouldn't. They'd just come out the other end. I'm sure we've all seen babies crawling and I'm a bit of a hippie. My babies used to crawl. I would never put my baby on the streets of New York. And I don't think I'd even put my baby in, uh, in um, that park in the, in the middle of uh, New York. <laughs> What's it called? Central Park. Central Park because I think there's drug addicts around the corner that slept there that night and threw their needle there and there are dogs that are <coughs> doing things on it. No, you're careful where you put the baby. I think I put my, might put my baby out there on that grass. And sometimes those babies get their fingers between the grass and eat the dirt, have you noticed? And it comes out the other end because we can't access it. The microorganisms in the soil break down the minerals in the soil and make them available for the roots of the plant. They are also responsible for the absorption of those nutrients into the plant. They protect the plant. They play a protective role. They protect the plant against any harmful pathogens and they nourish the plant. So the plant knows that it needs those microorganisms. So 50% of the fuel that the plant makes from photosynthesis, it sends back down to the roots to feed the microbes. Basically, it says, please stay. I'll feed you well. Because that plant knows that it needs those microbes. Beautiful illustration. And it's written on every plant in nature. Every plant takes with one purpose, and that's to give to give us apples, yeah? To give us peaches. I see some apples on some trees out there. The microbes aren't the enemy. They're an integral part of life on planet Earth. And now I'm gonna take it somewhere you may never have taken it before. And that is inside the human gut. When we were in our mother's wombs, our gut was sterile. Sterile meaning there were no 
microorganisms in there. Remember, there are 10 times more microorganisms in the gastrointestinal tract than anywhere else in the body. Lining our gastrointestinal tract are villi. And when we're born, we're literally showered with our mother's microorganisms. And that forms a thick turf wall over your gut. The two main flora are Lactobacillus acidophilus and Bifidus bacterium. There are many, many others, all made from those two. That gut flora plays the same role as the flora in the soil. That gut flora is responsible for the final breakdown, particularly the B vitamins in our food. That gut flora is responsible for the absorption of the nutrients out of the food and into the blood because this is where the food gets into the blood. So there's a blood capillary network all over those little villi. And these microorganisms protect the blood by not allowing any harmful pathogens out of the gut and into the blood. And these, these microbes nourish the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. Are you starting to see that these are our friends? They're actually not our enemies. <laughs> and the environment dictates their role. Unfortunately, there's a popular drug in, Amer in, uh, in America, Australia, in the world today, and it's called an antibiotic. You've heard of it? So let's have a look at what this word means. Anti means against. Yep. And biotic is life. Got that? Anything that has the potential to kill a small organism can certainly, anything that can kill a small organism has the potential to kill a large. What are we? We're the large. So let me show you why antibiotics have been used so much. Alexander Fleming, in 1929, he's growing bacteria in flasks in his laboratory. He comes in one morning and they're all dead. And he knew Newton's, law, Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there's an equal and an opposite reaction. Why is my bacteria dead? I was consulting with a man in, in Melbourne about 10 years ago. I said, what do you do for a job? He said, I'm a private investigator. I said, so am I. <laughs> We should all be private investigators. Why is his bacteria dead? He looked, in the, he looked around in the laboratory, nothing there could have killed it, and there was an open window, and the sun was coming down, and on the sun there was a heavy dust that was coming in and landing on his bacteria. He kept looking up, and the next story there was an open window, and in the open window there was a plate of fruit, and on the plate of fruit there was a mouldy orange. The dust from the mould came down and landed on his bacteria. So he called, he called the mould penicillium. And he called the, the mould waste, which is more toxic even than the mould, that dust that comes off, that's what killed his bacteria, he called the mould waste penicillic acid. And that penicillic acid is the penicillin that we know today. Penicillin has saved the lives of thousands, granted, probably millions. But we've got a problem today, and that's the overuse of the antibiotics. In Australia, in every doctor's surgery, there's a sign that says the biggest health care concern today from the World Health Organization is the overuse of antibiotics. You see, these microbes have the ability to adapt and adjust. Adapt and adjust. Praise God that we do have the ability to adapt and adjust. And if you keep throwing poisons like antibiotics to kill, guess what they're going to do? Adapt and adjust. And you've heard of superbugs? How were they created? Because of the amount of chemicals that have been thrown at them. 
I'm not against antibiotics. They can save a life. But the problem is today is the overuse of the antibiotic. And the overuse because of the inability to find out why. Why <laughs> is this active? Of course, the smoke is going to be coughing up yellow lumps every day. Doesn't mean he's got an infection. And by the way, what's an infection? It's just our immune system cleaning up something. And that pus is just dead white blood cells that have been called to the area because of the damage. It's because of the bacteria to the area because of the amount of damage. That's just the process that God put in the body to heal the body. The human body can cope with about two courses in a lifetime. Got that? Two courses. One lady said to me, my daughter had 22, 22 courses of antibiotics in her first year of life. Ooh. And what's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and expect different results? Yeah. You've got to find out why it's there. We've got to get away from the kill mentality. But something else is happening, and that is there are several professors, doctors, scientists that are showing the link now between cancer and fungus. And remember what fungus is, it's just an opportunist organism, it's there to kill up waste, so if there's a lot of chemicals, a lot of damage in the body, it's going to become active. How many people that have an antibiotic the next week get thrush? What's thrush? It's a fungal in the body. And what the antibiotics do is they are, now remember this, that drugs are like robots. I must do. They don't work with your body at all. So when the antibiotic comes in, it kills the bad, but guess what else it does? It kills the good guy, yeah. One writer said taking an antibiotic is like dropping an atomic bomb in the gut. And what did the atomic bomb kill? Everything. Everything. The good and the bad alike. That's why it's important to understand this and know this and work with this. If it's there, why is it there? It's just doing its job. It's just cleaning up the place. How many people have got a splinter? Oh, it's too hard to get out. Then the next day it's all pussy. Oh, don't you love it? Then you just squeeze it out. <laughs> Why is the pus there? Because you've got a splinter there. You've got something alien there. And that's the purpose of it. Put a grated potato poultice on. That'll even help it come out easier. And that'll pull all the pus out. You've got to find out why, why, why. Because if you don't find the cause, you will never have a cure. If you don't turn the tap off, you're still going to be mopping up in the other corner. So this child that had 22 courses of antibiotics in her life in the first year, is it just because she had an allergy to the cow's milk? And that's one of the main causes of asthmas, ear infections, chest infections. I was so pleased to hear that a lady told me her daughter took her grandson to a paediatrician. He had eczema all over him. You know what the paediatrician said? Stop the wheat because it's been refined and hybridised. We'll show you that. Stop the dairy. Stop the refined sugar. Oh, how pleasant. It wasn't just a drug. Drugs never, ever cure. And there are doctors that, are, and I've read of some reports, they said they, one doctor said, I was so frustrated because my patients weren't getting better. Hmm? They're often called functional or nutritional doctors, yeah? And they're more likely to look at the cause and work with the body. But I believe God designed that we all be our own doctors, yeah? That we make the decision. So your specialist, your doctor, your, your nutritionist, your uh, naturopath, they are your advisors. And what can you do with that advice? You can take it or you can leave it. So there's an Italian oncologist, and I've become under severe attack because I quote this man, 
But I'm interested in this man because he was getting a 90% success rate with conquering cancer. And what he was doing, he found that there was candida yeast in every cancer patient, and so he would inject the cancer with sodium bicarbonate. And sodium bicarbonate is just the ultimate alkalizer, and it just neutralizes the area because cancer likes an acid environment. He's written a book, it's called Cancer is a Fungus. I think he's in jail at the moment. He's had all his qualifications taken away from him and he's on a charge of manslaughter because I think one of his patients died. He injected him with sodium bicarbonate. Maybe he was about to die. You know what my husband said? Ah, oh, if only he'd injected him with chemotherapy. <laughs> would it be on a charge of manslaughter? No, he would not. No, he would not. And we, we've had people come to our retreat and I look at them and I think, <clears throat> will they last the week? You know, they come at the absolute late stage. Yeah. Often when medicine has said, we can do no for you, more for you. Mm -hmm. So how do you get it out of the body? If it is acknowledged that fungus can get into your body, number one, you have to starve it. And what's its favorite food? Sugar, yeasts. You've got to make sure you're not living with any mold in your house. Mold is a toxic poison. I've written a book called Self Heal by Design, and that book shows you the, the danger of mold and what you can do to get it out of your body. And you can order it at this website. Easy to remember Misty Mountain, USA. Not easy to get at the moment because of what's happening on TikTok and YouTube, but we've just ordered, um, sorry, I've already done that. I'm trying to master writing one thing and saying another, com. We used to print 2,000 a year. 2,000 books is lasting two weeks at the moment. So if it's out of print, it's coming. So Misty Mountain USA contains that's where you can buy the book um, Self Heal by Design, which is really an expansion of what I'm talking about today. So you've got to make sure there's no exposure to mould. If there's mould in the house, you've got to find out why. Do you need to cut a tree down? Do you need to fix the leaky pipe? Do you need to put some fans on? Because it's just an opportunist organism. It'll just be there where the environment is right. Number two, kill. I do think you've got to get away from the kill mentality, but the good news is there are herbs that will kill fungus and will not kill you. Isn't that good news? Garlic's a good one. Olive leaf extract's another good one. Grapefruit seed extract, another good one. Oregano essential oil. Don't all use all your ammunition at once. You know, two weeks on one, two weeks on another, two weeks, keep alternating. Because remember what these microbes do, they adapt and adjust. So when you change the, the herbs every two weeks, it keeps it active. Number three, alkalize. These microbes love an acid environment. Not everyone that has cancer um, has a large amount of fungus, but it's always, they always respond to it. Not everyone that has fungus in their body has cancer. <laughs> but if it's allowed to populate big time, it certainly can to develop into that. Cancer can have hundreds of causes, and in different, different cases it can be different causes. But, it, but to conquer a yeast presence in the body, we need to go to a more alkaline diet and we'll be doing a, a whole class on that later in the week. But basically your fruits and your vegetables, very alkalizing. All your stimulants, acid forming meat is acid forming. You've got to alkalize the body. And one of the best ways to alkalize the body is green drinks. Can you drink sodium bicarbonate? Well, all you'll do is, is neutralize stomach acid. We want to, we want to alkalize the tissues. That's where your green drinks can help. And you can buy 
powders like green barley, super greens, barley greens, mix that with a bit of water, a bit of lemon juice makes it a bit more palatable. Having that a few times a day, that helps to alkalize. One sign is your tongue. Your tongue should be pink from the tip to the back. If you can scrape off uh, that white, it's waste. But if you can't scrape it off, they're little fungus buds at the back. So looking at your tongue is a good guide. Part of being your own doctor is knowing how to read your body and also listen to your body. What something that really alkalizes the body is oxygen. That's why living in the country, having your windows open, exercising every day helps to alkalize by increasing the oxygen content of the body. We'll be looking at that in another lecture. Is it that simple? It is. The body can heal itself once you give it the right conditions. Because we live in a self-healing, self-balancing organism. And the body runs according to precision balance, so it's keeping that balance. As I come to a close, are there any questions? If we have questions, I'll repeat the questions so that everyone can hear it. Yes? Um, in the situation, I, I know Pastor mentioned that he wished he wasn't part of the sterilization and pasteurization of milk. He knew milk was the most perfect food, and it had so many enzymes that would destroy bacteria. So is it true that raw milk doesn't create lactose, that creates inflammation? Okay, good question on the milk. Do you know milk was created to feed babies before they had food? Did everyone hear that? People say, what milk do you drink? I say, I'm weaned, I eat food. So, so milk is perfect food for babies. Cow's milk is perfect food for baby cows. And breast milk is perfect milk for baby humans and the closest to human milk if a mother can't feed is goat's milk look at the size of a goat and the size of a of a of a human and the milk that's in the supermarket if you were to feed that to a baby calf the calf would die because it's been homogenized and pasteurized and that kills all the vitamin c and it changes the structure of it there are cultures that can handle milk. For instance, my, uh, I've got a friend, friends of mine that live in Africa. They have an orphanage, Nakuru, Kenya, and they have a lot of babies. A lot of mothers die from the AIDS. And they give their babies soy milk, and the babies thrive until they had a few Maasai babies. And the Maasai babies did not do well on the soy milk. Because you know what Maasai live on? They live on milk, blood and meat. And these Maasai babies were getting thinner and failing. And so my friend's husband went and bought a cow, milked the cow, gave the cow's milk to the baby Maasai and they thrived. So what's also got to do with this is our genetics. So if you grew up on a dairy farm and your ancestors were all dairy farmers, I'd like to suggest that you can probably handle it. But the best way for a human to eat that and again, it must be organic and it must be raw, is as yogurt or feta. See, that's cultured. So the five stomachs in the cow, and we've only got one, it brings it back to that state which is easier to, to digest. And so I have friends that have a dairy farm and I went and gave meetings in their little hall and every meal the children sat down to a glass of milk it's straight from the cow and their parents have been dairy farmers for centuries but I politely declined because it's obviously not in my heritage because I cannot, I cannot handle it. I had bronchitis as a child every winter and I now know it was because of, um, I could not handle the, the cow's milk. The current figures are in Australia and we've, we're a real cosmopolitan country because we've probably got people from every country in the world living in Australia now. Um, the current figures are 60% of Australians have an allergy to cow's milk. Mm -hmm. If that was raw milk, I think it would bring it down to 30. So, absolutely. So, I leave it with the person to decide on that. <laughs> yes? Um, 
Um, spirulina's from the sea, yeah? One of my concerns with anything from the sea is what's happening in the sea today. <laughs> and there's a lot of rubbish dumped in the sea. There's a lot of industry dumped their waste in the sea. So I'm always just a little bit of concerned with anything that comes from the sea. So then the question is, well, what about salt? Well, the salt that we use is the Celtic salt. And the Celtic salt is a hand-harvested sea salt. And France acknowledged the value of this industry. So they've made the whole area a heritage site. And it's quite incredible. The coastline sort of has a peninsula. And in that peninsula that they have, they have all the big um, areas where they they have the, the salt water and because of the winds and the sun in that area it dries quite quickly and it's hand harvested so you know that that salt is quite good and remember that heavy metals like uh, mercuries they sink to the bottom of the sea they're not in the seawater it's the plants there's your seaweeds <laughs> that take them up and also the fish eat the seaweed and the bigger fish eat the little fish so the larger the fish the higher concentration you'll find of mercury there's hardly a fish today that doesn't have some traces of mercury in it so tomorrow let me talk about tomorrow tomorrow we're going to be talking about the liver as an organ, actually, we've got another meeting today, haven't we? We've got two more, yeah. So at uh, three o'clock, three o'clock today, so next meeting, we're gonna be talking about the liver as an organ of elimination, and also the, it's your project manager, and in relation to that, the organs of elimination. And then tonight, we're gonna go on a journey through the gastrointestinal tract. So, when we look at the liver, we look at what the body does with the nutrients that come in and how it detoxifies us from environmental poisons. And you'll be so excited to know that our liver is an organ that's been to die, designed to detoxify us because it's inevitable, even if we have no chemicals in our home, <laughs> when we're out on the road, when we're, you know, it's inevitable that we are exposed and the body does have the ability to break that down. And then tonight, we're gonna to go on a journey through the gut. And as we go on the journey through the gut, it's an amazing process that breaks down the food we eat to microscopic little particles, and then it's absorbed into the blood. So that's today's program. So I look forward to seeing you at three o'clock. And what about, what about tomorrow? Yes, um, what we'll do is I'll, um, I'll uh, we'll work that out. <laughs> Will you be repeating um, the gastrointestinal liver um, class during the week also? Or yes. Well, I only just arrived last night okay. <laughs> and I'm actually not exactly sure how we're going with that. If there was a request to repeat, I guess we could do that. Oh, I see. So we just um, appreciate your feedback there. Yes? So in regards to fungus, mushrooms are like a big thing. Okay, mushrooms, good question. Is that something we should be eating or? If you don't have a yeast problem and if you don't have cancer, enjoy the mushrooms occasionally. Because as you'll find, we have a strong hydrochloric acid in our stomach that can annihilate or wipe out any yeast or funguses as they come through. Because it is true that uh, mushrooms uh, have B vitamins, mushrooms also have um, uh, the natural uh, flora in them. So there are a few pluses for, for the fungus. But if someone has a fungus presence in their body, they're best to, to not take that until it's conquered. There's these alternatives to get away from caffeine with coffee, and there's all these mushroom yeah. alternatives. Yeah, you've got a few different ones though. I think you've got Cafex here, is that right? Cafex, Roma. If you go to Trader Joe's, you'll see a whole lot of um, alternatives. And if you're coming off coffee, there's a book called um, Caffeine Blues, and he's got a chapter in there called Coming Off the Bean. 
And he says, if you have three cups of coffee a day, the first cup of coffee, you have half a teaspoon of coffee and half a teaspoon of Roma. And every day you have a little bit more Roma and a little less coffee. And so by the end of the week, you can be off coffee without any pain or suffering. <laughs> what what they, they're called um, alternate cereal beverages and they're usually chicory and dandelion roasted roots. So they have like a coffee flavour, but they don't have caffeine. Dr. Tullio Simoncini. I'll write it down. Now, in my book, Self Heal by Design, I quote all those books. And reading Dr. Tullio Simoncini, he writes as an oncologist. It's not easy to understand, but he does show the link between cancer and fungus. So, Tullio. Simoncini. And then also, um, you mentioned earlier on about people that were forced into doing things that they didn't want to do. Um, if they did do that, are there things they could do afterwards to... Okay, so I can mention that. And that's one big concern, is if people have been blackmailed into taking the the clot shot, and I'm sure you will realise there's an, it's not, it's not a usual vaccine, there's an mRNA. Now the mRNA is, keeps reproducing itself, so the spike protein, and that's why it's called the clot shot, because the spike protein causes nanoparticle clots, which are almost barely measurable. And so something to keep the blood nice and thin is cane pepper. Cane pepper will thin the blood and will help to break down those clots. But there are three things that will inhibit the mRNA from continually producing the spike protein. So I'll give you the three. One is zinc. And zinc is found in large amounts in pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds. Number two is dandelion. And a, a nice alternative to coffee is roasted dandelion. So whether that be the flower or the leaf or the root, the dandelion contains a, a plant chemical that inhibits the mRNA from reproducing the spike protein. And number three is white pine needle tea. So if anyone has been blackmailed into taking the, the clot shot, um, they will need to take one of these for the rest of their life. But what an amazing body we have that has in an inbuilt ability to be able. So these three all inhibit the process of the mRNA reproducing the, the uh, spike protein. I'm sure you've all heard of Dr. Peter McCulloch. Yes. He maintains, and he's got all the science behind it, but he, he maintains it does get less as time goes on. And there are apparently some placebo shots given, otherwise too many people would die. But if a person has several boosters, you know, the law of statistics take, even if they get two placebos, it's very rare they'll have three or four. Yes? Um, I did not have a shot, but I did a large blood analysis, and she said I had shedding in my blood. Yep, yeah. yep. A lot of people are concerned about shedding, and I do never want to get to the point where they forced us of, of um, being apart from people. That we live in an incredible body, and it has all these systems in place the, the problem is when you put a needle in, you've bypassed all the body symptoms. So it is, and I can't say yay or nay with the shedding. There are some claims that, that there be. And it's also with blood tests, it might show something one week and then a week later it might show something different. 
much depends on have you slept well? Have you, are you well hydrated? Did you eat well? Have you had some stress in your life? You know, that, that can certainly influence it. So just as we had a lady come to our retreat who wouldn't wear any of our bathrobes in case someone had worn the bathrobe that had had the shot. I do not do that and I'm not going to go there. We do wash and we do put everything on the clothesline so it's sterilised. And she wanted so us. That's, that's what we don't want to get to. <laughs> and you know that in communist countries, one of the first things they start at is getting people against people. Yeah, that's right. Yep, yep. So, and I just love the way Jesus went up to lepers, and he touched lepers. That, right. that I, I, ne I never want to get to that. And what is that but fear? And what did God say? He said, "I've not given you the spirit of fear." but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And my husband, if someone shows him their blood test, you know what he says? He looks and he says, oh, I don't believe that. <laughs> so last week a lady said, I think we should get a T-shirt. I don't believe that. Do you know, it could be wrong. They could be wrong. It may not be so. Yes? Whatever. 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 Whether you eat the green leaves, whether you eat the roasted dandelion root, whether you chomp on a dandelion flower a couple of times a day, whatever. The white pine needle tea, you might take it as a tea. You might be able to buy it as a supplement in capsules or tablets. It's whatever. Yes? It appears that the white pine needle is the one that has the actives in it. It's, it's, uh, it's good to note that the white pine needles are white, they're green. Yeah, they're green. <laughs> but, but when I was in Idaho, there were a lot of them there, and there's a whiteness in the bark, and I think that's where it gets the white from. Yeah? That's true. There's there's five needles in the spray. Yeah, that is true. When I was in um, in Idaho, the people I stayed with had an earth house, and there was two foot of earth on top of the little cottage I stayed in, <laughs> and there were white pine needles all around it. That was very nice. Yes. Yeah, wheatgrass. Yep, yep. And even if someone has an intolerance to wheat, they've got an intolerance to the protein or the gluten in the wheat, and the grass does not have that. So the wheat grass is fine, yes? Did you mention the fibers that you were saying? Uh, I think you were saying viscose Okay, there are three that, are, that you want to keep away from, and one is acrylic and polyester and nylon. Now, polyester's big today. You know, they have robes made out of polyester. And you know that mink blankets? <laughs> They're soft, but you, you, you touch that and touch the softness of, say, mohair. You know. But you, you notice that if you move it too fast, there's an electricity that comes off it. And that, that electricity in those plastic fabrics, did you know that that can interfere somewhat with our electromagnetic field? The, not near as much as the uh, phones, but they certainly do. So it, uh, it's midday, so it's time to have a break. I'm impressed that you're all still awake. <laughs> and we look forward to seeing you at 3 o'clock this afternoon where we're going to look at your liver. Thank you. <laughs>